Good morning. I'd like to call this work session of the Southampton Town Board to order on this 13th day of September 2018. Please rise. Join us for the pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Sunday, would you call the roll, please? Certainly. Supervisor Schneiderman. Here. Councilwoman Lofstad. Here. Councilwoman Scalera. Here. Councilman Bouvier. Here. Councilman Schiavone. Here. All right. The gang's all here. So let's get started. Our first item is a presentation regarding community choice aggregation. We will be joined uh, by Christine Fenton, our uh, Director of Municipal Works. Uh, we have Dan. Kartsman, Vice President of Edgewise Energy. We have Frank Zappone, my uh, Deputy Supervisor. We have Lynn Arthur, Sustainability Committee. Kyle Collins, our Director of uh, Land Management and Development. And uh, is there anyone else? Okay. So uh, who is going to introduce this? Well, I guess I will. Jay. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, this uh, presentation this morning is in part only about CCA. It's really about our stated goal of achieving 100% renewable energy by the year 2025 and what progress we're making towards that goal and how we uh, might improve the progress that we're making right now. Uh, and CCA is part of that, but it's more about uh, achieving the goal. So the board will remember that several weeks ago, staff presented to you a number of different projects that we're working on, our solarization program, our uh, home energy audit program, uh, and other things that, the, the, and, and some suggestions for making changes in the code that might move the town towards achieving that objective of 100% renewable. Uh, but today we really want to focus on two parts of that effort, and that is increasing local renewable generation, which is what we will need to do in order to achieve 100% renewable energy, and also improving uh, our opportunity for access to renewable uh, energy resources. So I, I, I wanted to begin that discussion by giving you a picture of where we sit today in terms of that goal. We've had an active campaign for about three years. We call it our Solarize campaign. The town board has approved that campaign each year. Uh, and we have been primarily focusing on residential uh, rooftop solar. And uh, we've had good success with that program, largely thanks to Lynn's outreach uh, with, with support from Christine's office. Uh, right now, we are producing a little bit less than 10% of the renewable energy for the, uh, the town's needs. So as we look towards that goal of 100%, this is close to getting us one-tenth of the way there. Uh, we have not yet begun to expand the opportunity, same opportunity for uh, commercial uh, residences, and we, we need to do that if we're going to expand on that 10% product production of renewable energy. Uh, one of the obstacles that we face, and we, we, we want the board to know this, is that for the past three years that campaign has been funded by a grant from NYSERDA, and uh, give or take a, a few dollars, we've uh, been spending about fifty to $55,000 a year on our outreach campaign, all in. That's not just about solar, that's about home energy audits, that's about um, uh, variable speed pool pumps, all the things that we could promote for the public to help them learn how to reduce their consumption. That funding is over. The grant is over. We no longer have that funding in the budget. So at, as of today, any outreach program that we have is unfunded uh, uh, going forward. You know, we'd, we'd have to think of, and I want the board to, to know that. Uh, the second piece of it is we talk a lot uh, about the wind farm project that's currently being proposed off of, of uh, uh, the coast of Montauk. Um, there's a lot of discussion about that, both pro and con. But the facts are that if it happened tomorrow and became fully operational the next day, it will not contribute one megawatt to the peak demand in the town of Southampton. 
That won't ever happen, even in its best iteration. Uh, so if we're thinking that that wind farm is going to help us achieve our goal, that's, um, that's not a valid conclusion to draw. And you're talking about the wind farms in the Bight area? I think Those, the one no. off of Block Island. The one off of Block Island. Yeah. 15 deep water. 15. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's south, uh, the east off the coast of Montauk. We're not going to get yeah. any from this either. Right. That's going to, and, and not to, directly, no. right. no. to, to the point. There, there is a, another proposal to add more turbines off of Block Island. Yeah. That would potentially power Southampton, but it's not there yet. But we, we can, we're, we, we're, what we're trying to describe to you is current reality. Current reality is this project is on the table. There's been a lot of discussion. The East Hampton Town Board has given some approvals. There are some other issues that have to be addressed, but the project is, if you will, shovel ready or close to being shovel ready. And, and just to illustrate the point, and I, I'm going to ask Lynn to talk about this because she's the one who crafted this, um, not, I wouldn't say simplification, but clarification of why that project will not help us. So as you, as you know, there are three load pockets. I think we all know at this point what that, what that means. Um, East Ham, the, the numbers in the bottom table, 133, 94, and 26, come from the measured consumption that the data comes directly from LIPA. We foiled, in fact, with uh, Janice Shearer, we foiled five years worth of load data for the whole South Fork, so we have trend data, which is interesting also. But those are the numbers. So in East Hampton, during summer peak, they consume around 94, well, they consume as low as maybe 80 and as high as 94. So that's the range of their consumption. If you look uh, on the right there where it says the Deepwater D DWW farm, now, everybody hears about 90 megawatt wind farm. Yes, it generates 90 megawatt. That's called the nameplate, you know. If it's fully operational and the wind is blowing as hard as possible, it will generate 90 megawatts. But by, by the time it comes over that cable, <laughs> the blue line into Wainscott, it's going to only deliver 34 megawatts. I got that number from uh, Jennifer Garvey. She stated that number in multiple public meetings, so this is, these are all facts. And she's with Deepwater Wind. Exactly. Thank you. So when the 34 megawatts is delivered into that load pocket, it's going to be completely consumed by East Hampton. And I'm going to ask you, well, unless, if, if there's a question, there was a question one of the board members gave me, was it you, about well, yeah, what about I, the winter? That's right. You, so, you mentioned peak summer days, which are the summertime, you, you know, go, highest electric usage. Can I show that? In the uh, fall so and yeah, yeah. spring, there are significant winds, of course, and they'll probably so, be operating at full capacity, and the electric usage will be much less than peak. Obviously. So I was curious after you said that to me, so I went in and pulled the data last night. Mm -hmm. And here's the results. In the red, so what you're looking at are graphic representations, a full calendar year for the same year, 2016. East Hampton is in the upper left, South Hampton is in the lower left, and Montauk is on the right. And to answer your question, no. In the winter, they're going to use between 38 and 45 megawatts on average to serve the needs of East Hampton. So while there might be some excess capacity, because just like plumbing, if you think of the grid as, you know, plumbing and water, and you're injecting into East Hampton at Wainscott, all the power comes from across the canal all the way to Montauk. When you're injecting into that point, any excess capacity is going to go east. It's not going to come west. So even if on the lowest day, they're using maybe 20 megawatts, so maybe there's an excess of 14. It's going to go east to Montauk to serve its needs. And looking at those numbers, the East Hampton peak, uh, the electricity provided by the wind farm will not uh, satisfy East Hampton's peak needs. Exactly. Not even close. That's exactly. Correct. And yeah. they will make some storage. contribution yeah. to their similar goal, but you're absolutely correct, Tom. It will so not the, satisfy the storage, their. Uh, strategy there it won't meet that either I, pretty obvious you can see that 
Yeah, you, you might know that, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but there is a study that PSEG is doing right now, undertaking about storage and how to figure, it, figure that out, so. No, but I mean, but, just looking at what you produce, what you're able to produce and how long you can store and what the peaks are, yeah. you don't have any overage capacity. You're absolutely so, right, John. So, so to get so, back on track. So to, to focus on, and maybe to be a little trite, these are potential obstacles, but I think what we want to share with the board today is that these obstacles present some opportunities to us. Uh, and we want to explore what those opportunities are and hopefully get from some guidance from the board about which of those opportunities should we be pursuing and how should we go about pursuing them. So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about what other opportunities for renewable other than what we've just discussed. Uh, so we, we, we have other things, and this is where the planning department plays a very important role in Janice Shear and Kyle and Mike Lieberman have been working very hard on looking at some of these things. One of them uh, being community-based uh, large-scale solar projects. The other being large-scale or residential battery storage projects and uh, biomass fuel cell projects and, and tidal generation projects. Now, the reason why I mention the planning department, I'm going to ask Dan uh, to talk a little bit more about some of these other projects because he knows more about it than I than I, is some of these projects we aren't currently equipped in our code to manage these projects. We may love the idea, and I think there is some support for it in the community, but our code doesn't allow it to come to fruition as it currently exists. So the planning department is working on how should the code be modified so that if we want to pursue this effort, the code doesn't become one of our obstacles. Was there anything else to add to that? Comment? No, and those recommendations came out of the sustainability plan. We've been, uh, for some time, been putting together some uh, draft legislation for the board to consider for uh, the community large-scale solar. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Dan, um, and I know uh, Jay knows the president of this company, uh, Sammy Chu. Sammy was hoping to be here today uh, uh, but on last minute he was not able to come, but he said he would make himself available to the board. And the reason why we connected with, with uh, uh, Sammy and Dan is because they are a company that is looking into private and uh, public partnerships for uh, regional or community-based uh, uh, energy generation. So I'm going to introduce Dan and give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about what they see as an opportunity, potentially. Thanks, Frank. Um, my name is Dan Kartsman. Just to give you a quick background, I uh, started a company in 2010 called PowerSmith Home Energy Solutions. From 2010 to 2015, we were responsible for uh, not just the largest impact of residential energy efficiency on Long Island, but also the state of New York. Um, from there, I was recruited to NYSERDA to be senior advisor for market transformation, uh, reporting to John Rhodes, who's now the chair of our PSC. Uh, and now I'm working with Edgewise, and one of the key areas that we're focusing on is municipalities. Uh, I want to uh, applaud uh, the town of Southampton for, you know, taking this 100% renewable goal. I think it's, you know, fantastic. Uh, I think it's absolutely, you know, what's needed. It's why I work, uh, you know, in this field. You know, that being said, there is some reality that needs to be, you know, faced if to get there in the next, you know, seven years. And power supply absolutely is a huge part of it. Um, there's really no getting around that when you start to look at the numbers. Um, whether, you know, CCA or not is more, as Frank said, is more of a detail with this, right? You can, we can, you, the town can move forward with CCA and that works. The town can not do CCA at all and, you know, focus more on public-private partnership uh, and that works as well. Um, you know, what's important is that if the town wants to get a jump on this, uh, you know, especially considering the number of years to get to the goal, which in energy and power is not a long time, um, especially for the amount of energy that's going to be needed here and the realities of how much you can reduce demand versus when and how you can get, uh, you know, sustainable generation created, you know, there's a decent amount that, that goes into that. That being said, you know, when you kind of zoom out a little bit and look at what's available on a national level and on a state level outside of municipalities, 
but to create renewable energy or demand reduction, you know, all of a sudden you're bringing a lot of other factors in that reward private investment for going, you know, into things this way. So that's really, that's a huge um, uh, feather in the cap of the town, so to speak, that, that puts the, the winds at your back. Um, <laughs> it's one way to put it, I suppose, um, and it's something that will absolutely, you know, have to be uh, have to be looked into and, and understood. Especially a town like this, you know, with national recognition, there will be no shortage of, of you know, uh, private uh, investors and, and developers. However, you, you decide to go, that would be interested in that. I'd say, you know, the other piece is that towns can the the town um, doesn't have to wait on CCA if it goes that way at all. Um, there's the constituents of the town can begin to reap benefits immediately from pilot projects. You know, the details that, you know, aren't relevant for this meeting um, become important, but if the generation storage or demand reduction is within the town, then in the way um, uh, Lynn said, you know, about how power flows, by definition, that's going to affect the town. and. You know, it's what you guys have been doing with Solarize and what the work you've been doing with EVs is absolutely great. You really need to take the next step uh, to have some, you know, significant generation, significant demand reduction, and, um, you know, significant um, storage put in place. So, again, no, no downside to, to at least looking at those options now. And in fact, I, say, I would say the only downside would be to not do it now because again the length of time it takes to put these kinds of projects together not to mention the, the things that you face every day as, as a board and, and the politics of it. I'd say the last um, uh, piece and I'm not um, uh, you know I've worked from a private angle with municipalities um, the reason why Sammy and I know each other is uh, you may have heard of a few years ago uh, the town of Babylon started the Long Island Green Homes program um, and what we got to before um, Supervisor Ballone uh, moved to the county was we actually had a renewable uh, uh, it's called the PACE fund um, and whether we look into doing that you know, um, you know, here or not, it is a possibility commercially, for sure. Um, you know, residential, there's still some more work to do. Um, Supervisor Berlone's obviously very much aware of it. But we got to the point, using a surplus that they had, to ha create a self-sustaining fund where in five years we uh, impacted about 4% of the homes in the town of Babylon, about 69,000 homes across the town. In 14 years, uh, the NYSERDA had only impacted uh, about one and a half to two percent um, statewide. And what that shows very clearly is how these public private partnerships can really work. And when the municipality is behind this in a significant way, what you can accomplish. You know, unfortunately, when Supervisor Ballone left, there were some politics uh, and money began to become drained from, from that pot, but until then it was what people were paying going in for the work that was done was being reused and it had a, it was 100% sustainable. So basically what you took some of your surpluses and then you used it to fund solar installations, is that uh, what it, primarily? In this case it was residential energy efficiency. At res on res home solar and then in the tax bill at those properties the town would get paid back? The, yeah, the money that was forwarded from the surpluses. So that's what you mean by self-sustaining. Yeah, exactly. A revolving fund revolving being fund. collected through the PACE program through the property taxes. Yeah. In addition to the property taxes or taken off the regular property taxes? Um, well, added to your property tax bill. Yeah. On top of the property tax. Yeah. yeah. So, but it was collected through the property tax bill. So it's basically a loan I, yeah. secured against the property and collected through the Exactly, and it was it was designed and executed. So you know, we did home audits, we did a lot of modeling, and so you were paying from the savings created through the energy efficiency. You know, my company, PowerSmith, um, at the time we were saving folks anywhere from 25 to 60 percent, uh, and you don't see anywhere near that uh, amount of efficiency work being done 
through uh, now peace peace egg because it's a, it's more piecemeal whereas because of having the town on our back we were able to be more holistic and give the yeah. full solution which is what not that's to get to i think that's actually a requirement of that pace program is that the savings exceed the debt service that's a requirement of the on bill financing yeah. piece of it um the town of babylon had slightly different requirements but all the same one thing i do want to make the town aware of you know Residential pace is one way to do this. Um, it it has some challenges, but there's many many ways to to skin the cat in in this case, yeah. and that's just the one that we did at the time that worked for the town. And some of it's in here. When you're talking about the public private partnership, because I know we're going to get into the CCA. <coughs> I mean, is that in the context of um, private investment dollars into infrastructure costs with the municipality? Like, how how does that look? Yeah, and exactly. So in, in this case, it would be so. If you look at any of these, let's take um, you know large scale battery storage for the town, which in itself saves a ton of money because you may or may not know, but those times, of those you know, ten hot days in the summer where you have that peak load, to bring that um, down is worth a lot of money because it reduces a lot of strain on the grid across the grid, right? So. So you're basically looking at, to answer your question more directly, um, you're looking at project finance for these kinds of things, where you put in storage, we, you can have outside investors come in because you're financing against um, the future receivables. That's how power plants are created. Um, that's how any, you know, any sort of large-scale renewables. Uh, in in a very, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you, no worries. I, I just want to mention something that. Frank knows how to board speak. He <laughs> <laughs> dummies it down very respectfully. There, 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 there is there is a similarity in what Dan is describing here, in one option, to the kind of relationship we have with Renaissance Downtown, where they're a master developer, mm. they understand the industry, they are working with the town in partnership to develop projects that would benefit from private investment to bring those projects through fruition. So there's a, there's a similarity in, mm -hmm. in structure to okay. these, not, not as the only option, but as an option. An option. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. If you're done, no, Frank, I think you're um, The uh, program in Babylon, were those expenses that were put onto the tax bill, were those tax deductible, at least at that time? Um, I, to be honest, I, I don't know. There were there were uh, aspects of projects that were tax deductible. Mm -hmm. So it, at the time, it was uh, you know sort of measure by by measure as the, the tax code was. I don't. It wasn't necessarily the town tax code. I believe. It's, I believe it was federal. Also, there was a big gain. Exactly. Efficiency tax. Credit exactly. On that. Exactly. So as long as you were up to date on your taxes then you could qualify um, if, you know, for the PACE fund. The loans were 15K or less, and they had to show a return of um, you know, uh, 1.3 SIR, and basically that meant you were paying from, from your savings. So yes, you could, use, you could use both sides to make it as economical as possible. We also leveraged rebates from National Grid, from NYSERDA, from PSA. I mean, anything that we could do or leverage to make this work um, for the town and, and the homeowners. Uh, is what we were what we were doing, and I'm so, wondering if that has changed uh, given the new federal guidelines or um, rules on yeah. writing off taxes. Yeah, so I haven't. Uh, well, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But it's not cons okay. And I'm not up to date on the the federal tax code for. But for good question, Tom. Well, so re re relative to, to cars, because that is the one thing that mm -hmm. I, I do know about those things. Mm -hmm. And. There's been a lot of push to buy EV vehicles because we get we get that benefit. But <laughs> we're at a point right now where it's really up in the air. We have no idea what's going to happen come January this year, even. So, no. right. Yeah. The, so the the question and the point that Tom is making really helps us understand what we're trying to to present to you that that there's room for looking at projects and policy simultaneously so that we could address issues like you're raising here about what's the viability of different projects and what opportunity does any policy change uh, create for us. And, and the board I know would be concerned is that if we're creating an opportunity, what's the risk associated with that opportunity, if any. So well, I wanted to go to the next phase and talk about exploring some of the options of project activities, which could happen simultaneously with exploring the opportunities that might be available to us with uh, CCA. And one of the things I want to emphasize with CCA, so, so we've laid out a, a timeline, 
and and what we'd, we'd like to be able to to conclude this meeting with when we get to the finish line is that the board is comfortable with the idea of beginning to open up a discussion through a public hearing process about how the community feels about CCA so the board can gather some uh, uh, feedback on that. And we all know that, that there's, a, there's a legislative process associated with that because we have to go back and adopt a law. Uh, so the, the first thing that I, I want to emphasize uh, is that at each milestone that you look at in this timeline, there is uh, an opportunity to say, we don't want to go any further. We, we've heard enough, end of story, let's go down some other path. At every step along the way, up until the very last step, there's always an opportunity to afford to bail out. And at any given step, no matter how deep into the timeline you go, there is no risk to the town. You've not committed to anything, there's no liability, there's no financial commitment to the town. Uh, there are other issues down the road that need to be addressed, but we're a long way from doing that. We need to know, and I think the board would want to know, what's the appetite in the community for taking this approach? Uh, so what we've laid out here is a well, multi-step. I'm sorry, Frank. It's, it's twofold in my view. It's also educating people on what CCA is, which proves to be a very problematic. Uh, no, no question about it, John. I didn't mean to, and thank you for bringing that up. Part of helping the public give you valuable feedback is helping them understand what we're talking about. And I'm going to draw a quick analogy. I know that uh, the planning department has a meeting on Monday night for the community of Hampton Bays to talk about the form-based code. You want feedback from the community about form-based code. I know you do. But it's the planning department's responsibility to go out there and educate them to what is it? What is form-based code? So that they can give you some informed uh, uh, reaction. So we, we see this as very much a part of it. And for me, I don't know about for others, it goes back to the point that I made earlier. That outreach program piece of it, education piece of it, piece of it is very important. Right now, we have no funding in our outreach program. So we, I, I, I'm drawing, an, I'm underlining that point. For the budget. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back later and underline it one more time. Uh, so, can I make a quick point on CCA? Absolutely. Well, one thing it's important to know, you know, about CCA, if you did go that route, um, the PSC has outlined all the steps necessary to be taken. Uh, outreach is a fundamental part of that. That plan has to be filed with the PSC. I mean, this is very has been very well thought out and has happened in a you know number of towns and counties. That being said, you can do all of this without CCA. Fundamentally, what the CCA does is it means is that is constituents would have to opt out to be able to and then they just go back to PSEG and how things are done. Now if they went to PSEG and wanted to be renewables they'd be paying more they'd be paying a premium for that and is it even really renewables? No. It's you know you're you're you can't tell once it's in the right it's green it's green labeled unless it's actually cited in the town. So that's one piece. If you don't go CCA all of these things can still be accomplished it would just have to be if you wanted the, to create the aggregation piece, which helps you, helps the funding, helps everything about it. It would be opt in. You know that can be that can be done. That's another that's another way to do it. You know for the town um, constituents. All this being said, the reason everything works is because the needs of Southampton are different than the needs of other municipalities in Long Island. The opportunities based on the grid, based on load areas that are constrained, and this goes for every town, town and municipality in Long Island, are, are different based on those physical properties. So to be able to look at the town, the town's unique needs, you know, any aspects of wind that might be coming, you know, by 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 passing this resolution. There's no risk, there's no downside, there's only better understanding of what's possible and how close you can really get, if not, and what it would take to fully achieve your 100% renewable goal in a real way, not buying credits. And my understanding from Frank is the town is committed to really to, to getting there, not in name only, but really, but really doing it. Which I want to just add something to what Dan just said, and, and this is really the answer to the question, Tommy John, that you asked in the meeting we had earlier this week. You asked. Um, how would CCA help us uh, change the direction of some of the plans 
that PSEG has, for example, the $513 million transmission enhancement <laughs> that was told to us was the justification for, not, for doing the South Fork RFP because they were going to push that out. And then at the end, when they actually awarded that South Fork RFP, they added it back in again. So right now there's a plan to install a new transmission line from the canal all the way out to Montauk. Um, the cost is somewhere between $513 million and $750 million um, because of other equipment that they need in Wainscott, et cetera, et cetera. So I contacted a few people, and one of the individuals that I heard from last night was the former director of the PSC. And what she told me was, once you have a CCA in place, you have standing. So you have the ability with CCA on the books to petition the PSC to say, hey, we think we've got a better option for the South Fork to utilize that, and instead of doing this, this, you know, this wires solution. You know, it is whatever, it's battery storage, it's whatever we come up with. It's going to cost less. It's going to bring higher value to our, um, to our rate payers. It's going to be more reliable. It's also um, the, the basis on which the whole project was based. We've, with the planning department, foiled, like I said earlier, five years worth of data. We've had a meeting with uh, PS, PSE&G to validate, to ask them to validate back to us, do those numbers that you gave us back in 2014, are they still the same? Because we have, we're in 2018, there's more data. And the answer is, they said, yes, it's the same. You're still growing at 2.7 percent. That's our projection. We stand by the projections we made. And the reality is the data that they <coughs> gave us does not support that. So here we have a cheaper solution. It's more resilient. It's based on newer technology that they're not planning yet to deploy in their plan that we've crawled through, as Dan's company has as well. It's cheaper, and it brings more value directly to our, our rate payers. So it's a leverage point. Exactly. But do this, does the infrastructure um, needs of PSE&G and their whatever, does that stay in place? Like, are we still subject to their infrastructure? Yes, because... Okay. Right, and that was the nature of my question. Like, to what degree do we have input on the infrastructure and those improvements in the town of South? We have a learning from the Eastport polls. We want greater say. Yeah, we have a mechanism. Yeah, turn over to Frank. Right, we have a more meaningful seat at the table if we have more local control over our energy consumption, and and CCA has the potential of providing that. Dan is correct, you can do it without, but I think the two together uh, provide a complementary uh, um, effort that strengthens our seat at the table to address your question and gives us more options in terms of where can we find renewable energy. But, the, does, the, but does the infrastructure part of it change? Like, do no. we have the power even with the leverage? Well, to change going forward, yes. Yes, that's yes, what I'm Yes, the plan, the, the $513 million project that is in their plan. We w once we get to one to the third step there, yeah. we don't even have to award, do the RFP and award it. Once we have a CCA local law in the books, we have standing and we can start to petition the PSE to say, hey, here's other options. We want you to open this funding because that becomes a funding source for us to fund, a, you know, a battery program. The, and one of the for example, one I'm, of just, I'm, I'm just I'm just a little skeptical only because I mean we had legislation that required them now to give us notice of, of these things before they go into place and they blow it off anyway. Well, so I'm just that legislation is not. I contacted Fred Thiel's office as recently as yesterday, and that legislation has not yet reached the governor's desk. Okay. And one, as you know, once it reaches the governor's desk, they have ten days to either uh, sign, sign it or, or deny it. it. Yeah. And so okay. it has not yet reached his desk. Okay. So this is, you know, having worked closely with, you know, John Rhodes and Richard Kaufman, I could tell you that this is absolutely 100% in line with reforming uh, the energy vision uh, in the state of New York. Um, the other key piece is anytime you're talking about power in terms of megawatts, uh, inherently to have a relevant seat at the table, you have to, you, you're going to want aggregation 
of you need the, the buying power. Yeah, exa absolutely. Yeah. In yeah. Buying group, however you want to do it, and in the most simplest way, in a lot of um, you know places in Westchester where they started was aggregating customers and then going through the wholesale market to negotiate cheaper rates. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be part of the solution. It's not enough on its own, but it shows that when you aggregate, you know what are all of the things that can be accomplished. I would also just one last point on yeah. what you brought up with you know in working with PC. PSEG Long Island, we're going to have to work with the town. We'll have to work with PSEG Long Island. Absolutely. Um, they have a track record of doing what you just said, and this allows us to go straight to the PSC, straight to um, Chair Fer uh, straight to John Rhodes, and say, hey, wait a minute. This is not something you, you can just do. We didn't hear this. You know, they didn't follow these rules, and this now has to go on hold. And nobody wants that. And PSEG itself is only doing things to become tighter with the rest of the state. They just joined the joint utilities, you know, which is basically how the you, the IOUs and their own utilities in the state um, talk with the Public Service Commission, Department of Public Service uh, staff, and you know, take the position of all the utilities taking their own, you know, aggregated power into you know, what are these legal orders. So I I think to come to a, a finish point. There is, it's, it's the feeling of the people who've been discussing this among the staff, that the best up, uh, direction forward is to do things simultaneously, and they can be done. We, the, the, the staff is very knowledgeable and skillful. Uh, we can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Uh, I think we should, we uh, the, can pursue independent, uh, standalone projects on a large community-based scale, and we can uh, proceed with CCA and I, I wanted to illustrate that we we are part of a growing trend this uh, scattergram type map shows you all of the municipalities that either have an operating CCA it's up and running and providing services or they have adopted the the local law which we are talking about here today uh, that local law is on the books and and so this this diagram shows you that uh, this is data that Lynn gathered, so if you want to add some information to that. When we met the last time, um, there were 20 municipalities in Westchester. There's now 26. Um, there's around 200,000 households um, in Westchester. That's a CCA that's on its feet. Um, and then there are another almost 50, and they're listed down the right side of the page. I try to cut and paste it because it got really small. Um, Janice says that the Municipality that's closest to Southampton in terms of numbers is Mamaronic, and they're mm -hmm. in the CCA. Um, and there's actually one other chart, if we could just fast forward to the very last one, because Julie asked a question about what was the real value to um, keep going, keep going. There it is, to homeowners and um, the people who were in the CCA. So since uh, 2016, um, Westchester Power, ha if you were a former Con Ed customer, you would have paid, if you stayed with Con Ed, I mean overall, $8.8 .8 million is the difference between the, C the lower prices delivered. And there's the graph at the bottom. They offer two options in Westchester. They offer an all green option, and most municipalities select that. But they also offer, um, a, a brown option, which would be, you know, some mixture of fossil fuels at a little bit lower cost. I have a quick question on that. Sure. Um, so I was reading, and it's uh, New York State has a 100% zero emissions goal. Is that the same as 100% renewable? No. Okay, because they say that nuclear energy is considered, they count that as toward their zero emissions, but if you're going re uh, renewable, you're not going to count that. Right. Okay. The big driver for the state is through uh, the Governor's REV program. And that is 50% um, renewable energy mix for the state of New York by 2030. There's also, I want to say, 39% energy efficiency um, reduction uh, in one other piece. But it's really driven by um, 50 by 30. Oh, sorry, one last part. The, to understand the, where, <coughs> how the Westchester savings came in, there's uh, two main um, <coughs> projects. One was the wholesale markets that I that we spoke about, buying group essentially, and the other one was is called um, community development generation, and they put in a a large um, 
uh, solar array that basically, you know, because most, not all houses and buildings, only about a quarter of houses and buildings are in the right, ha have the right orientation, everything you need to site solar, but that doesn't mean you can't, again, how the way the wires work, that you can't, you know, site a large solar array, we're talking in, in the megawatts, and people can subscribe to that if you're not CCA or it gets built right in if you are CCA. Yeah, and, and actually, if I could, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a little here. But remember this chart, you've seen it a hundred times. When you do a community solar project, you see, remember this, this is the homeowner, how the homeowner gets the value. Um, this is rising rates over time. If you put solar on your roof, you're gonna pay on this. If you finance it, you're gonna be on the blue line. Over 30 years, you will have saved $158,000. Here it is, $152,000. That value, that $152,000, when you put solar on your roof, that is going directly to the homeowner, right? When the utility does projects, that value, they keep it. When the community does a project, the community, through aggregation, gets the value versus the utility. Does that make sense? Okay. And with, and you know, one other thing to, to mention about the real power that, that the town has, I believe, in, in, in this area is the town is so well known, it's not so difficult to put this on the map of, of you know Richard Kaufman's team as well as Department of Public Service and and PSC that now you, you are really an integral part of the conversation and at the very least you know that's a big difference maker and game changer for the town and for its constituents. Thank you. You mentioned that all we needed to do was to pass the CCA law, get legislation on our books, and that would increase our standing with PSC and G as far as infrastructure and yes. other decisions that they yes. make. Um, I'm assuming the we is the town of Southampton, the town board of the town of Southampton. Um, I have a lot of questions about uh, the administration of CCA. This may not be the meeting for that, but okay, moving forward, we're going to hear, okay. hear more than so, that. So, to, to conclude, what um, and I did have one other. Well, we're asking. You <laughs> already have a copy. You've seen <laughs> copies of the draft legislation. And to Tom's question, staff, Janice, I neglected to mention Mike Lieberman, who's been very involved in this. Christine and uh, Kyle and, and Lynn are available. They understand these things a lot better than I do, but they're available to meet with you for discussions. And through, if we agree to go forward with the public hearing process, there will be many opportunities, hopefully, to uh, not only inform the public, but inform the board. And not so much because the board needs this, but I want to make an analogous statement to you. What we're asking for today is similar to, in, in many ways, asking you as a board to authorize the opportunity to borrow money for a project. You authorize that opportunity. At some point in time, we may actually borrow the money or not. But what you've created is the opportunity to borrow that money. We may decide, and we have done this in the past, that the project isn't going to go forward and we don't include it in our borrowing and therefore there's no uh, liability to the town. Approving the CCA legislation is akin to approving the opportunity to borrow. At some point in the future, we, the rubble will meet the road and we'll say, do we actually want to implement it? Do we actually want to borrow that money? That's down the road. Uh, but right now, it's the opportunity, it's creating the opportunity to put that consideration on the table. And that would be after extensive public hearings, obviously, because we're still a little the last, law anyway. That's the, that's the beginning. Yeah. Steven, do the that's local That's the office. very last yeah. part of that timeline. And, you know, well, where we are is notice of public hearing, right. step one. Right. So, it, it, uh, uh, and then lastly, I, 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 I have. Um, I just wanted to address Tommy John's question. So, uh, Tommy, there's extensive, there's already an order that outlines exactly how Duke would implement CCA, the process of getting an administrator. Before you do anything, it has to be filed and followed. So, that's already laid out. And how about the policies within CCA? Would that be created by that administration we, or this board or a combination of both? This is a really, we've, we've uh, been through we, this with the through whole this. board okay, sorry. before yeah. you well, join the, the team. Can, it's about the administration it, of CCA. Yeah, so this is a big discussion. We'd be happy to. Yeah, and I'm not trying to generate it now. It just, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll take all that paperwork. Well, it's important information for the, not only for you, Tom, and other board members. Okay the community needs to know what that is, that the administration is, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's really important. And we're best in the past whether yeah. that could be a not-for-profit. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It is a not-for-profit uh, in Westchester. Yeah. So, uh, concluding statement. Uh, I, I've, I've become a fan of this little book uh, uh, written by Mr. Bloomberg and Carl Pope, who was the former CEO of the Sierra Club, and I neglected to mention that the young lady to my right has recently been selected as the energy representative for the Long Island chapter of the Sierra Club. Oh, uh, so uh, 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 Lynn has added another credential to her already vast <laughs> set of credentials. So, uh, But the point of this book simply is two things, and I'm going to emphasize one and state the other. One is don't look outside of your own community for solutions to these bigger problems. Solutions are done at the local level. Uh, and the mayor talks about his role in the city of New York, but there are also other uh, cities and, and municipalities that he points to as the place where these solutions really begin and they begin to take hold. Uh, so he encourages that in this book. But he also encourages something that we already have articulated as a town, that smart energy decisions are smart economic decisions. And I'll use one example. Uh, we recently, and we're about to complete, a town-wide LED lighting project. We made that decision for lots of dis different reasons. But one of the reasons we made that decision is over time, it's cost-effective. We're going to reduce our energy costs. We're going to reduce our maintenance costs. Uh, we're going to be able to deploy staff in ways that provides more support in other uh, uh, parts of the organization without adding um, uh, with the expenses of additional staffing and additional salaries. So a smart energy decision is a smart economic decision. And I think that mantra applies to what we're talking about here today. Uh, so we, we would like the opportunity, to, with the board's permission, to um, introduce the legislation into the public hearing process and, and begin to move forward uh, with that in the timeline that can go, as you know, we can have two, three, four, as many public hearings as the board sees fit. Um, to that point, then, when we have the notice of public hearing, we have to have the local law in it. So should we have discussions with all of you? I mean, like, when are you looking to do this, like, just in terms of a time frame so we know when we need to get to you by? I think the local law is drafted as... Yeah, it is, but we all, like, I, I just have some... I think we should be discussing some parts yeah, of this publicly yeah. just so that everybody understands it. It's, com it's complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and for somebody otherwise engaged, as most of the public is with you know, their work and their lives and whatever else is going on, it's, it's very intensive. Um, What's the best method to do that, exactly that? Should we meet in smaller groups? Uh, it's it's, it's kind of up to you, however you want to do it. I mean, we can also, I guess, just notice it and then have the discussions. I mean, the, the things that I want to talk about, I mean, are, are for discussion points, not necessarily a change made, but just things yeah. that you know are on my mind as I'm looking at this, um, and I've shared uh, several of them with you. Right. Um, so however you want to do it. I mean, I, I, I guess you could do it after you notice the public hearing. Well, I think board members all have copies of the draft mm -hmm. legislation. If you don't, we can send them to you. Um, you tell us if you want to take more time to read it and then contact either me or Janice or, or Lynn or Kyle, Christine, uh, to uh, set up an individual meeting and if after we have a series of those meetings that address your specific questions the board sees fit to have a work session on the legislation and the introduction of the public hearing uh, uh, we, we certainly can do that. Well, I, think I think it's a combination it's, of all of the above. I, 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 I would but, uh, agree. But I also know that uh, you know through the public hearing process I, I would fully expect it is a complicated piece of legislation it's hard to understand it's part of the outreach program mm -hmm. as well but also that it will evolve, much like we've done with CPF and other things, it will evolve this law as, as we learn and move forward and address all the different issues, that, like Council was clear. Is, I have some, some questions, too, and I'm sure every board member does. So I, I like the evolution process uh, that we learn yeah, from I'd, I'd like to make this just and I, I think all of those things are important, John. I would agree with you. I think Realistically, if we thought that we could start the public hearing process in a month's time, that should give us enough time to address the questions that you have. And I think at that point it's fair to say, and I don't want to speak for others here, but uh, I think one question the board would have once we introduce the public hearing is what's the plan for a public education process? Well, that, I was going to say, because even before we get to the public <laughs> hearing, <laughs> the public needs to know what we're is we're even contemplating yeah, to even if they should show up because they they, they need that advanced lead Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, and Mike, you know, I 
and we all have these conversations, but quite often when we have conversations, if I've talked with Christine or Tommy John or Julie or Jay, uh, we may not be up to this up to the same place. So mm -hmm. that mechanism, I think, is really important in this case because I think this has to come from a full board. That's you know in, in absolute agreement. This has a widespread impact yeah. across the town and a good one in my view. Um, but everyone has to be satisfied that. Absolutely. When you talk about combining purchasing power um, you know Southampton is a limited pool you have East Hampton is also a limited pool Brookhaven is a larger pool um, are, are are the other towns having conversations about CCA because if it's gonna move forward it ought to move forward with a, the largest possible pool to get the you know the best prices on utility right yeah. so we are happy to have. Have you met with Brookhaven yet? Uh, no, but I could. That's the I've big. I met with people. Fish. Within, within Supervisor Brookhaven. Romain is very savvy on energy issues mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. and I remember the last time we talked about it, I had some concern whether whether CCA was something that was authorized um, in our area, and and part of it is you know some of these other areas like you mentioned Con Ed up in Westchester, you know you have these private utilities, and we had a private utility, uh, local. Um, now we have basically LIPO, which is mostly a public utility for the most, for the most part, and they then contract out with PSE&G, um, their management company in our case, so they might be a utility company elsewhere, um, and their job is basically to pool the purchasing power of Long Island and to buy energy in real time at the lowest possible prices with an enormous body of customers. Um, so if you, you know, if you see how they operate, you know, they are constantly choosing every hour or even less than that whether the power is going to come from this power plant or that power plant and making sure it's a competitive process hourly. You know, CCA is a little bit different because you tend to enter into these long-term power purchase agreements that lock in a rate for an extended period of time. And there's tremendous volatility, as you know, in utility rates. Um, there's a lot of factors from the renewables to the, um, you know, new supplying, you know, the shale oils and things like that. So, yeah, you know, and then wars breaking out in different places. And, um, so you end up with a highly volatile market that you've locked into. It could be very positive. It could be not so positive. Um, whereas the current arrangement is we have an entity that's charged with on a, in real time getting the best prices. So I think that they have to somehow be part of this operation or this discussion. And if we are going to go the CCA route, um, you know, I think we need, to, we need to understand that although property owners can opt out, they will have that choice. Yeah, um, it is a step that they will have to take to opt out. Mm -hmm. So they'll be entered into this program. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suppose if uh, the, the PSC and G rates are far below what they're paying, they could get out. But um, can, can I, so there's some protection. The well, can I, I correct I, I, something I, I real quick? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just want to, just so we're, we're dealing with fact, there's a couple of things. Um, so when you, it turns out that when you get into um, distributed energy resources, that what you talked about, about island-wide aggregation, mm -hmm. they end up doing a lot of averages, and that's not how the physical properties of the grid work. Um, what's really important with grid is congestion, and so that's a node-by-node -node, um, aspect. And so the work that um, the PSC and ICERT has been doing, and now in the Utility 2.0 um, draft of where they are and where they should be, they are now looking more load-by-load, -load, and instead of us dealing, instead of Long Island, dealing with the spot market, we actually, up till now, Elipa has bought, uh, has invested in peaker plants. Yeah. And some of those peaker plants, they create emissions, they're older plants, um, and they're absolutely 100% <laughs> against the, the renewable no, goals. Sure. So they the, put two out here. the point, right. the, the, the larger point being, how it, what worked, and this is nationwide, and it's called, this is called the utility dust spiral or utility 2.0. Um, nationwide, what used to work when you had central generation no longer works when you have grid edge generation and demand reduction. We're really facing, you know, a brand new era of energy and how to distribute energy. Um, That's certainly the, 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 the model is changing. The paradigm is shifting. Absolutely. There's no doubt. But, you know, 
We are also looking at like deep water wind, as we mentioned earlier. That is a point generation Absolutely. coming in, but now instead of coming from the west, it's coming from the east. And but we're not, the point is, I, I need to make this distinction because CCA is a tool, but when we talk about power, where we get it, we get power from fossil sources, right? Uh, what we're talking about is the sourcing of this power here. We have a renewable energy goal that we're trying to meet. So as part of that tool, this is just part of it. But I think we, as a town, need to be really cognizant of where we're getting this power from. So it, it is about pricing. Yeah, but the state, the state also is moving toward renewables. Yeah, but not quite the quite the pace that, that we've set out for ourselves with the goal. That right, but the CCA and you... I'm sorry. You're, go ahead. You still have to figure out how you structure your CCA. You have to have the yeah, renewable no. generation out there, and we can initiate projects, and that's good. Otherwise, you know, you're buying. It used to be the, the the green choice program, if you remember that. You know, where we're paying a premium for renewable energy. The renewable energy was actually upstate wind farms that was entering the grid. We weren't necessarily getting those electrons right, here, right. but, that's but not we were forced. That's to, not we're not this is a little different this here. Is different. So we're looking we, to do projects locally and not do but we can um, do those projects with or without cca to me yes, to, to go absolutely. to cca to, to me to me it would have to be a not for profit i'd have to feel a comfort level that it would was not an entity that was just out basically to make a buck absolutely. and maybe leave our ratepayers hanging no, absolutely. i'm just i'm not trying to make absolutely. a case one way or the other and this is this is a complicated really issue and all i'm saying is before we jump in we ought to have a conversation you know, some of the other stakeholders, I, you know, I'd love to have, you know, LIPA in the room, I'd love to have PSE&G or the PSC, other players involved to say, okay, these are, the, these are the true pros and cons. Before we jump into a public hearing process, and certainly you could go to the public hearing uh, process and not progress it until you have that input, but I would personally, before we m make the leap to the public hearing, I think we just need to do all of our due diligence and seeing what what the pros and cons. Those other areas that are doing CCA don't have an arrangement like we have, where we have a management entity that's charged with getting us the lowest price. Well, a well actually, um, is that that's a misnomer. That is right. not true. Yeah. They, are, they are not getting us the lowest price. They have a lot of contracts. The reason why our rates are so high is because of, the, of their business model. They have many, many, many contracts that they, that are 20 year contracts um, you know, with the power well, plant. That's a complicated answer. You know, it is. I mean, but we're carrying debt. But, we're carrying but, debt from shore but you're but on you're, our bills. We're carrying the availability of those plants. My concern that you're misrepresenting how competitive their pricing is that they're providing. Because well, I don't. I, I'm. I mean, what I'm trying to say, and this is this is a complicated issue. If you look at you know their rate structures and what you're actually paying, um, part of it is just the availability of that energy those plants, even though they're not buying energy from those plants, to have those plants there to produce that energy, you're paying a premium for. And I don't know if you go CCA that you can escape those commitments. I don't know without them in the room. So it may not be oh, as lucrative we should, yeah. as we think. I, I guess I, I it's a, a, this is a complicated yeah. Let's bring them in. They, no I don't think anyone said it's simple. No. Yeah, yeah. But, I just it, have a few, few points and I'll try to make them very brief. Um, as of two years ago, um, we were paying about the second highest rate in the country for power That's right. here on Long Island. So, so I'm a little skeptical on whether they're doing the best job for their rate payers, uh, just given that fact. But, um, but that's not also, just the rate. I think that th this, if we don't even go through to the CCA, affords us the opportunity to facilitate change island wide in that. We don't need to build new fossil fuel plants on spec, spec, on spec right. um, that we're looking at the radial health impacts associated with the fossil fuels that we have online already, that we can facil uh, advocate for um, waste to energy plants that are currently on Long Island that are going to get hit with more uh, higher tipping fees once the town of Brookhaven closes their ash fill, that maybe they can get the renewable energy purchase power agreement fee so that we can keep them in place because waste, as we all know, is a renewable energy. It has so many different potential impacts for the better, for quality of life, uh, coastal resiliency, local impact on change. 
Um, that's, all, that's all I have to say about that. Well, and I, if I could add, I, those, I, I, those incinerators are all at. I, I think the discussion volume. that you're asking. They can't oh. take more. They can't should, take more volume without should. expanding the incinerators. That that discussion should absolutely happen, Jay. I couldn't agree with you more. The, the, the question is, do we have that discussion, and we have standing in that discussion, uh, or not? And and the argument that I would make personally is that. Having CCA on the books gives us standing in that conversation, where otherwise we are talked to, not talked with. And I would rather be in a situation that the town be in a situation that we talk with people and not have people talk to us. That's what I think the opportunity that CCA creates for us. And that's that's so why probably can't we the, do both? Why can't we do both in parallel? That's, that's probably the wisest co course forward. Um, I would say. You know, and we do want to come around the table with LIPO and PSEG. We know the LIPO board is very interested in this. We know the REV movement is interested in this, even if we did it as, you know, a potential, you know, REV demonstration, which is happening across the state with different things. And, you know, because LIPO, the LIPO board is interested in this, you know, PSEG would have to listen. And I agree, as long as this is non binding, you want to be in a position of strength for that conversation because it is such a thick issue and you've got to you know, do the proper due diligence. I'd like to hear that. My last conversation with LIPO, they had some concerns about it, but I'd like to hear that. Absolutely. It's great that they're on board with it. Well, I think that's part of the problem. I mean, I can't speak for the board, but some of the. If folks I understand on this correctly, I mean, would they. I would expect them to have concerns if we're doing this because we're kind of. It's not a little bit of a power play. So well, I, I don't, I, I, but yes and no, we're only 50,000. What did Tom Falcone say to well, you? He, 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 we're only 50,000 rate payers well, that's out of 1.3 go million. The aggregation question was when Jay said, you know, I'd rather have, you know, Brookhaven with us in East Hampton, which sure. makes sense just logically. You'd want the more the better. But you seem to indicate that that maybe wasn't the way because of how the distribution or something was right. So. But would it help to have East Hampton? And can you help me just understand? Yeah, why? absolutely. Um, so aggregation is necessary. It's the size of aggregation. This just comes down to how the grid works, right? Every um, you know substation, they're called you know lo load serving um, area. Every node has a certain amount of electricity that it can process. When you have to um, grow a substation, um, that's you know, tens of millions of dollars, if not, if not more. So what it really turns out to be is aggregation around the node, because that's the way the money flows. Now, if you're dealing directly with the wholesale markets, then, you know, cross island aggregation could make sense, but then you're throwing all sorts of things to averages. And that's a real problem when you look at REV and what REV is, is really about. And if you look at, you know, any of the policies that have been put in place uh, from the governor's team, Richard's team, uh, to the NYSERDA team, um, and staff to some, to, to some extent, they recognize that to get to real grid value, not just carbon value, you have to look at the node level. And this is again, not to beat a dead horse, but this goes back to the utility 2.0 model. You know, in their uh, update, they talk about the utility of the future team, which is happening, you know, nationwide. It's happening in Chicago with Comet. It's, you know, California is way ahead of the game, you know, and CCA in particular, but you know, most of the things that they're doing to promote renewable, uh, renewable energy. So the thing that I actually think makes the most sense, there's enough aggregation within the town. Just as Southampton or maybe with East Hampton? No, we were told that actually I, I by think, Jewel as well. I think, I think you want to, you, if it's me, I would want to start in the town because there's enough aggregation to explore responsible projects that would bring rates down and, and hold them down, but not so much aggregation that all of a sudden LIPO or PSIG is you know, worried about how the money's flowing specifically. We're solving their problem for them. They but have do we leave the leverage? Is it, not as, is, not, is it not, I guess I'm not just understanding, it's not as strong as a leverage point to, to have them worried? Shouldn't they be worried? Like, isn't that the you know, making them have to listen to us as opposed to, you know, like you're saying, talk to us instead of at us. Yeah. Well, they're Don't in you similar, need some type of a... Of they're a, in similar transition. We're just, you know, we're ahead of it. I, ultimately, yeah. I think any any power utilities is realizing that they're ultimately going to have to get to that point. I, they're just so They would be from worried from a precedent setting that mm -hmm. others will join us. No. Oh, so that's, that, that's, that, that, that East Hampton, though, then you're creating the situation where we have this pool of energy buyers in Southampton they still have to provide 
their rates and their energy to Montauk, they're still going to probably want that transmission line to get out to Montauk. I mean, it would make sense if at least East Hampton and South Hampton were to combine together. Well, we should. We, so we have been we have. working with them, and we 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 have been. The leadership has been coming from the here. Road. We haven't been. We have been working with them. They do have an active uh, focus within the Energy Sustainability Committee. That Dieter and I go to those meetings. Um, I That's think logical to me. It, it, so you more buyers, but you get. We don't want them we'll though to. You just can't. Slow you can't. Us down. Sorry, Lynn. You can't answer this question without understanding uh, the grid congestion on a node by node yeah. basis. You simply can't. Politically, sure. You know that makes that makes logical sense. But everything about Rev from the governor on down is let's look at real data. And you know I think one of the things that you know certainly preliminary talks with LIPA and you know things of that nature. More information, the better. Um, but to your point, the town, I think, if considering this, has a real responsibility to get to that data. And up until now, and, and uh, you know, Life of Peace Egg is not the only utility. I lived this for two years as, you know, uh, you know John Rhodes, senior advisor. When you read between the lines, the utilities are dragging their feet. And that's understandable, mm -hmm. right? A 200-year-old business model is now going away based on physics. Right. If we have this model in place, I think in part to the question that you were asking, Christine, if I understood it correctly, if you look at our timeline there, one of the, the benchmarks or the milestones on our timeline is request load data. That's a, a request that's taking much more meaningfully if we have the potential of CCA in our hip pocket. Uh, otherwise, and it has been the case up to now, that request has been Dismissed. Ignored. Yeah. So, so they have like a legal obligation to comply with our request should we go mm -hmm. this route. Yeah, and I think we would get the support, as Dan has pointed out, from PSC and from the, the NYSERDA and from the governor's mission with REV to say, it's a fair request. You need to respond to these folks. Mm -hmm. uh, this gives us standing in that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we may get the data and say, oh, this is, this is a big matter. mistake right, for right, us. Right. We don't want to go anywhere. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Thank we'll you. follow up. I'm sorry to keep our your next uh, uh, panelists waiting. So. It's not like it hasn't so happened before. In <laughs> summary, but in summary, where are we? We're considering. A, I got a requirement to do a pros and cons state with stakeholder we're meeting. Do some more due diligence, but if you know somebody wants to move forward the resolution to notice the public hearing, we can discuss it formally at a town board. Yeah, meeting. the board members have requested copies if they don't have. Uh, opportunity to review those copies of the draft legislation. I'm not ready yet to introduce it as the and, lead sponsor. And so, request um, responses to those questions from any of the staff. Those of us here, I see Janice is here in the audience somewhere. There she is. And she's and Michael, who's not here, uh, are all capable of, of responding to some of the questions. That there you was may a have. bunch of interesting things that you had put on the first slide. From you know tidal energy to you know biomass, uh, and we didn't get to talk about any of those other things. We talked primarily about CCA. Well, what well, that's so, a component of CCA. Yeah, well, well, it's well, a, it, with or without we CCA, can we, can we can do can, those things. Yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll be moving those it, forward it, with or without the CCA. Yeah. Be yeah. happy to talk yeah. to you yeah. about those things. things. We have a couple, uh, several project ideas in the pipeline <laughs> that we want to iron out some wrinkles to before we present them to the board between code and, and town-owned properties that might be viable. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're picking the brain of, of uh, Can I ask one more uh, question? Uh, Dan's company to see okay. how viable one are these projects. Just, 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 just one more question. One for if one for we one. were to go with one of these things without the CCA, would that mean then that we would be doing this, but then the infrastructure for whatever they wanted to do just conventionally would also be taking place at the same time? Could. Yeah. Depends on big county. Once that cable goes in, it's going to be very hard to compete with with them for cost of energy. So without, without so right now, the agreement is sense. between LIPA. It's a basically a power purchase agreement. So if we have a CCA, it would be between the CCA and the. But I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm more looking at the impacts on infrastructure, which is what we in reality yeah. deal with a lot. We were dealing with peak repair that plants and fending them off like you know three years ago, four years ago, and I know it's looming. And I'm just, my concern is, or my question, I guess, is trying to understand what the CCA gives us in terms of leverage or say a seat at the table in the context of 
infrastructure things, which you know is a, is a large component in yeah. addition to the buying power. I we mean, could that's, run that's our a, own we, Southampton RFP for renewable energy generation. There's a lot we, that we could potentially right. do. Absolutely. And, and then we, we have the ability to thwart the project. We we go we use the PSE. We petition the PSE to go to LIPA and say this project for 513 million dollars is a better way to do it. Here's and here's our argument. Right now we have no. And you're saying, but we can do that only with the C. CCA. CCA oh, not otherwise, right. we have no standing. We don't have any standing. And, and your argument is strengthened, in my opinion, if you could well, they don't have to listen demonstrate to that you have a viable local demonstration project, the REV project, as Dan pointed to, that's up and running, and you have some data to support what it can do. Limited data, but it's a pilot project. And you have CCA. You put the two together, and I think you can petition PSE, as uh, Lynn pointed out, and say, we have these two things together. We would like your authority to put a hold on this so we can extrapolate this a little bit further and see how much potential it yeah. has. And I think we would get support from them. But without the two together, our argument is good, but it's weaker. Can we find out? I have one other question. As state. far as policy for individual homeowners, we have the infrastructure, the PSEG side. Um, but with homeowners, the CCA would be controlling the policy. For instance, years ago when people had solar arrays and they were not using the energy, that energy would be sold back to the grid. That is no longer the case. Now it's banked. That too is going to be changing. That is a policy that we really don't have control over, and, and that would be something that we would we would be able to influence or control. Potential. Yes. For example. Yes. Okay. Yes. You're to think about the economics sure. of that. I mean, well, we could so, you do know, it, those but kinds of things. whether the, it financially the, makes sense, who I'm not sure. The technologies are okay. changing. I just asked the town attorney to also you know. look in, like, okay. literally. Well, you know, what, it should, what, it should be said, though, that like, PSE like, and, and LIPO are like, progressing like, certain things, like the storage, oh, you know, good. battery okay. storage, and they've done an RFP. Follow up after. So East Hampton, no, they're building, they're building battery in East Hampton. It's like the tortoise and the hare. Battery storage in East Hampton is, I believe, Thank you. They're having an issue. Right. It's not perfect. Well, don't everybody run it once. Well, that, All right, so we're a little behind schedule. We're going to move on to our next item, which is an update on plans for Ludlam Ave Avenue Park. They just have to change the, the monitors. All right, so uh, not really. <laughs> uh, why don't we talk about other things while they change the monitors? Um, <laughs> You need a you need a second. All right. Um, <coughs> I keep talking about the crowd. So. We'll just wait till John comes back. This, yeah, um, I, I did drop it a couple of times. My daughter gave it to me for Christmas. Yeah, uh, keeps the water cool or hot. Yeah, but I just, I just put water in it. And it's. Yes, like I can a, see that. Oh, yeah. This could be a weapon, too. It's, you know, it's, I, I've been asked a number of times what's in here. But I want to know what legally. But it's good to drink a lot. Yes. I would like to In fact, hello. Very closely to our taxpayers. But that's part of the. That they don't have a lot to take advantage of. They can jump in and out. No, that's the problem. They actually can jump in. No, no penalty, which makes it then we're not aggregate buying. The whole thing falls apart. Everybody else works. How easy they make the opt out. If they opt out, and there's a penalty. There's there. no penalty. Yeah. And that's how it's written, and that's where I'm having this internal. Well, how do you actually Read negotiate a penalty? We have this. Can Somebody opt this out. is a really good article. I don't know. It goes through some of these things, and it talks about that idea I'm sure they'll about, um, you know, I like the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people there who felt that this was a no doubt. 
looks like a nice structure. It's not. Is okay. there anything in like that we can read? Yeah, I gotta find the name. See if you can find it. When I was at the Association of Towns, they had a whole thing on utility and um, She was very savvy to say that. These companies pitched the CCA to communities. So that's why I kept saying it's got to be a nonprofit. Like, I don't want anyone no. making the money off of this. You know, we assemble it as a. You know, well, an administrator would have a salary. Yeah, but it would be an administrative salary. Yeah. yeah. But nobody's making a profit. No, so that would be antithetical to what we're trying to do. Antithetical? Antithetical. What Jewel, Jewel does, they, they make the money. They make Who's Jewel? Jewel Energy. They were oh. the first ones who came in. Uh, and they get a piece of the energy. So. <laughs> The tiny piece of it across everybody's utility bill. Long time no say. All right, so John's back. So let's let's jump in. It's all right. So are we ready to switch now? It looks like we are. So we're going to switch to uh, an update uh, on plans for Ludlam Avenue Park Community Multi-Purpose Building. We have a number of people who are part of this conversation, including uh, Kristen Dulos, our town's park, town parks director, Christine Fetton, our director of municipal works. We have representatives from Savick and Murray who are our consultants. Uh, Frank Sapone, deputy supervisor, will also be joining joining us. Uh, so what's your, what's your name? <laughs> Jeff Batanjo. Jeff? Yes. Okay. Jeff Batanjo? Batanjo. Jeff Batanjo from Savick and Murray. Uh, who is going to, uh, and we have a number of members of the community who are here, who are here. I I'll see. Uh, so who is going to lead the conversation? Um, well, Christine, uh, Kristen will lead the conversation. She's asked me just to do a, a, a brief introduction about the process that I know the board is very familiar with. The, the design elements that you're looking at today are, uh, were, are the outgrowth of many, many uh, uh, months of community input into what this 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 uh, facility uh, should look like. There had been a long time ago an effort on the part of the Parks Department to do some improvements to the site, and the community has had an interest in having the site expanded as a as a recreational facility to provide more opportunity for other kinds of programming. So uh, the community, along with uh, uh, Renaissance Downtown, uh, the the, CME, uh, the Children's Museum. Uh, and, and others have contributed to the design elements that you see in the presentation that's made today. Uh, uh, so it's, I, I want to emphasize for those of you who don't know it as well as I know some of you do, that what the, the drawing was not a con concept created by the Parks Department, it's, uh, but in partnership with the Parks Department through input from the community and what the community saw as a viable opportunity to expand some programming in, in the uh, Flanders Riverside community. So that's correct. Um, so um, as Frank was saying, we've been working on this for um, several months now. We actually have a grant through DASNY um, for uh, partial funding of this project. Um, the thought is to initially start with a 2,000 square foot center structure, which is that center structure you'll, you see on the screen. Um, this um, part of the process called for designing that portion, but also designing wings. So the project could potentially go out as one phase, two phases, or three phases, depending on funding, and also um, after seeing how well utilized the facility is at 2,000 square feet, making sure it's a viable, um, you know, option that's being well used, um, potentially by the town's departments um, or through some licensing agreements with the Children's Museum, which has been talked about throughout this whole process. So um, Jeff from Savick and Murray is here today. He has a, a brief slideshow that will bring you through some of the floor plans, um, fixtures, finishes, materials, things like that, that are planned to be used. Um, again, a lot of those floor plans and um, the design of the building was based on input from the community. Um, 
in particular, uh, Renaissance Downtown was uh, helped put together a lot of the plans and um, with the input of the Children's Museum. And a lot of it was also, I mean, even driven in terms of the height of the ceilings and stuff by um, requests. Correct. It was, um, the building was highly customized towards the thought that it would be used for this purpose. For Simi. Um, for Simi. Correct. Yeah. Correct, yes. Is um, that an actual what it would look like? or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's with the two wings. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's the overall, yeah, phase one, two, and three. Okay. Yeah, initially, when we were conceiving it potentially, you know, just as a park improvement, um, it was a lot less, um, you know, we initially were looking at just improving the current building that's on the property, which is a public restroom. Um, then it kind of went to a less sophisticated modular structure, um, and then it sort of evolved throughout time to what you're going to see today. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I think that Do you want to go up to the uh, yeah, sure. podium? I'd like to flip through this that has the, um, the actual location map on of the building. Do you just go over one right there? That's it. Yes, thank you. All right, so the first... I'm going to have to go closer to that microphone. Oh. Yeah, I think right about there should be fine. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Again, I'm Jeff Patanjo with Savick & Murray. Um, we're part DCAK engineer, architect and engineering from uh, Bohemia, New York. Uh, we were hired by the town of Southampton to come up with the, the design plans and the bid documents for the structure. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you was where the building is going to be placed on the site. This is a property survey that was pr provided by the town. Um, we have it located where the, where the fest suited on the property, which is off, off to the side. Um, the town is in the process of getting the health department application for the new sanitary system, which I believe is, oh, we got it. Actually, that's the first, first problem is solved. They have a health department application in submitted and they have a permit. Uh, the proposed building, as you see, is adjacent to the parking lot. There could be some modifications to allow for ADA access. There will be ADA ramp to it. All of the, the, the surrounding will be uh, concrete. Which is the front? Which is the, the front will be in on the uh, east, the west side. Oh, good. Okay. So you walk, the, that's the front of the building will be the west side. Okay. So there'll be a handicap ramp there. And you'll see on some of, and I have a set of plans that I can show, there is a portico. It's going to be a big covered area. So it's going to be all uh, big concrete area, open area. Uh, the, back, the back of the building is going to have, a, again, a concrete patio with play area and space for the the, whatever the use of the building will ultimately be. Um, there will be landscaping um, around the building just to, to beautify the area uh, and all of the grading and everything will not impact any of the, the existing structures that are on the site, specifically the, the, the tennis courts that are right there. Uh, those won't be impacted and all stormwater drainage will be collected underground as required. Any questions so far? Um, I obviously see the phase one, or perhaps phase two and three of the building there. What's that shaded spot behind it? That's the, uh, just the grass area behind the, the concrete area behind it. Okay. It's just a hatch pattern. It's just a little dark on the screen. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So that goes right up to the property line? Yeah, right up to the fence. But we'll, we could put a buffer, a landscape buffer in there if, if it would like. Is there a residence behind that? There is. Yes. So it might be a good idea if during the landscape plan with the ultimate final design document, <coughs> we can add a landscape buffer of some sort of an arborvitae or a tray or even some fencing. But, but I, I believe that dark piece that's right on the property line is just that grass area with the sidewalk on it. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. So it's not concrete right up to the property line. No. It's, it's kind of like a little walk mm -hmm. to the sidewalk. Yeah. And everything else is existing? The parking's already there? The tennis yes. courts are there? Yes. Yeah, there's uh, basketball courts there. Um, it was a tennis court That's that was recently yeah. converted to okay. a basketball court. Yeah. The, the, everything right now, the addition of this project will be the installation of the handicap ramp to allow for ADA access. And then also creating some handicap parking stalls directly across with, the, across with an access aisle. So well, there's the, a, currently a building where this building is going? Is mm, there other, no. No? no, the building is down closer to the yeah. street. And will that remain or will that be removed with this project? That building will remain. It's the public restroom still for okay. the park facility. We are um, planning to try to do some um, improvements to that building too, just internally through our department. Um, you know, especially if we're going to be putting the new building, we want <coughs> to try to enhance everything. So this so new building will not be necessarily serving 
as the restroom for the use of the park. Correct. All the time, anyway. Okay. Um, what's there now where that where the building is proposed? Just the grass field? Or grass area. It's just the grass area, correct. Okay. And phase one, we are going to include a heating plant that will be able to heat the uh, yes. phase two and phase three, correct. Thing, obviously. Yeah, it, okay. I'll, I'll get into all the heating and okay. cooling in, 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 in a couple of slides. Uh, if you could go back, please. Okay, can you go back one more? Yeah. Uh, okay, so f phase one is the main building, which includes ex exhibition space, one classroom, the, the open foyer, hallway, and bathrooms. Um, and that, like, to, uh, there's the perfect question, is all the facilities that are needed for phase two and three are going to be integrated in the initial plan for, f for phase one. So everything will be there and it could just be added on to and it's going to suffice for phase two and three. Um, phase two would be classrooms with a folding partition. Those are uh, 1,000 square foot each. The main building is 2,000 square feet. So the phase two Big open classroom, but with a sliding partition, so you can divide it off into two separate rooms, which you'll see on the next slides. And uh, phase three would be the imagination playroom and connecting corridors. So the, the intention of this build is to do it, and um, actually presented by the town, is to build it in modular design. Um, so that being said, main section, phase one, modular. We pour a, a foundation. Um, put the building on it. Phase two and phase three, foundations with the buildings on them, and then you stick build the, the connection corridors. Uh, phase one is designed with half of a full, full ceiling height basement with nine foot ceilings for storage. Uh, the other half of the building, so you'll have 1,000 square foot for storage. Uh, the other half will be a crawl space, and both of the phase two and phase three are designed with crawl spaces, and that is it. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, one more. Okay. So as you see in here, and I'm a little blind, so um, the, when you walk into it, uh, the main, main area, that's going to be the, um, I can't see these now. Can't do Which this is the main entrance? Yes. So, so A is yeah, the main so entrance. A, well, a, a right there is the main entrances, and as you see uh, in the section of A, that's going to be the covered patio area, which will be all concrete pavement, and there's the handicap ramp over to the left. When you walk into the building, you're going to have section B, which is just the foyer area, just an open meeting area. Uh, if, if they want it, they can display artwork on the walls, and we can work out wall wash lights for artwork and what, what have you. Um, D is going to be the classroom area. You see the stairs in between D and C. Those go down to the basement storage area. C is exhibit space. Again, it's going to be an open room could be utilized as a classroom, but we're going to have specific lighting for exhibits and uh, whatever the use that will be for. Um, F is a warming kitchen. So a warming kitchen is nothing more than two ovens and a couple of sinks. No, no specific health department requirements or laws for it. It's just really to warm up food if they do have events. I don't think we're planning to put an oven. There will be a microwave, microwave oven, okay. refrigerator, okay. sinks. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so H and G, G and H, are both the, uh, the restrooms, and there's a couple little closet areas mixed in there. Um, <laughs> can you change the slide, please? All right, so this is the uh, phase two section, which includes the two separate classrooms with a partition wall. In general, it's one big, one big open room that you can subdivide into two little rooms. Change the and then phase three is nothing more than one big open room, uh, just for, for whatever use you intend to use it for. If you're familiar with the Bridgehampton uh, CME location, I, and Steve Long is here from CME, but I think the intention of this space would be similar to um, some of the exhibits they have there. Um, and I don't know. It's it would be about a, a thousand square feet and it would give us some flexibility in terms of the kinds of exhibitions that we would install. Yeah, we're not going to be able to hear you on our recording. I can hear you, but I'm afraid that our viewers at home are not going to be able to hear you. If you want to, Steve, do you want to come forward? 
I have a question in the meantime. The uh, access corridors, will they be coming off of the main foyer? The, uh, kind of set in the center of the structures on the wing? That's a very good will they be forward? They are good, yes, they're coming off of the main central uh, central reception, the main foyer area. Okay. Yes, both accesses are. Great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So this is Steve Long. He's the director of the Children's Museum of the East End, and he's been involved with this project since its inception. Uh, so, uh, so Steve, can you just repeat what you were saying from the audience? So the uh, A indicates about a, a thousand square foot space that would be for exhibitions in the facility. They might be uh, traveling exhibitions, for example, the Museum of Math. Uh, has uh, an exhibition that they wanted to loan to us. They were all set to go. Uh, they want the exhibit to be used for uh, underserved families. I said, that's great. Could you call me in about a year's time? Because <laughs> the facility is not yet ready to go. But uh, that might be one way to use it. And then also the museum would be curating different kinds of exhibitions uh, designed for young families as well there. Does the main, the main um, the phase one also has an exhibition area? Yeah, it does. You, you'd be able to utilize that though during that time, right, for phase one? So for, what, 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 what I would, when I spoke to Kristen about this, the initially, we were going to have classroom spaces. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm envisioning for that phase one is that because this phase two, we don't know when that is going to be available, that we would run classes in room C and room D in phase one. And then once phase two <laughs> and three were completed, uh, we would use, if you could go back, <laughs> um, to. We would use room C for, it might be a, a community gallery where uh, you know, we, we might exhibit work from children at Phillips Avenue School or, or other groups in the community. Uh, and then D would be uh, used, kind of reconverted for office space because we are going to need, if, if we're having yeah. an exhibition area and we're having ongoing classes, we will need some space for uh, staff to work. Uh, I was only asking because in phase one, I think C is being um, altered or adjusted to have that higher ceiling space, if, tell me if I'm wrong, so that they could do exhibits there, but if they're not going to use it for that, it's going to be used for classrooms. Well, what's the... The ceiling yeah. height is around eight foot, six inches. Oh, I thought we went with the higher one in phase one for that. For the exhibition, yeah. okay. So, uh, but my understanding of that was just for the thousand square foot space that that would have the higher. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. The the wings would have a higher okay. ceiling space. However, um, I think you know when we had discussed um, phase one, we did rearrange some of the floor plans to because um, uh, as Steve was saying, section D had some offices um, included as well a conference room mm -hmm. and we altered it to allow for this bigger classroom space area um, and then as far as section C I mean I I know you're saying you're planning on using C and D for classrooms but if you had like a traveling exhibition such as mm -hmm. this math exhibition something could yep. probably be could. put in section yep. C in the interim um, until you know phase mm -hmm. two or three could be accommodated and, and section B I mean, if yeah, I mean, Section B is quite large, too. Um, that's the uh, reception area. So, um, again, all of this is sort of this, preparing for a larger build-out. Since we don't really know the timeline for the larger build-out, I don't think we do. Does this work, just the first phase? If it, you know, Let's say it's years, three or four years before the second phase. Is it something they'll be able to function and provide some programming for this community well, in we'll phase one? Mean, Jay, as you know, we're, we're doing it currently in the, in the Riverside office. Rediscovered <laughs> conference room uh, okay. there on the circle. So yeah. uh, it'll, it'll certainly be uh, an improvement over that. I, I, I hope it won't be three or four years because I, I think... Right. Well, that, I don't know the availability of funding yeah. yet. So it's something the, the board has to discuss. We And there's, I think, quite a bit of CDBG money in the first phase. Mm -hmm. And that might be something that could help fund future phases. There might be other grants out there, state grants, that will help. But... Uh, Sometimes those things take longer than you want them to take. I just want to make sure if, if it 
if there is a, a gap between phase one and phase two, that phase one is useful to your purposes. And it sounds like it is. And we can also use it for programming as well. So we intend to do that to the extent we need to. So we can use the building. Yeah, I think the Youth Bureau has expressed some interest in expanding some mm -hmm. of their programming into this facility as well. Okay. So now we see the layout uh, going into some of the specific details of the construction of it. It will be a, as I said, we're pursuing right now modular construction, which is going to be typical wood, wood framing, two by six walls. Uh, we're looking to utilize the certainty, uh, the the vinyl siding, cedar perfections, sort of, you know, composite, but it looks like a cedar, maintenance free. Um, all of the uh, this the cladding for the windows and the doors will be um, all wood. Uh, the the, all of the trim is going to be vinyl trim, so it's maintenance free. It's going to be a typical architectural style uh, asphalt shingle roof. The columns in the front will be fiberglass, maintenance free again, with aluminum gutters and leaders. So it's, it's going to be built sim very similar to house construction, a high end house construction, uh, which will be virtually maintenance free. Other than a, a power washing here and there, there's, there's no maintenance. Just the typical example of what the siding looks like. Um, it's not going to be that big of a structure, uh, but it's going to be you know vinyl siding, like I said. All the vinyl trim will be all white, asphalt shingles, and aluminum gutters and leaders. Go to the next one. Uh, as far as the finishes on the inside, all the flooring will be a vinyl flooring. We'll use our luxury vinyl tile in the playroom and the exhibit spaces. Um, typical vinyl flooring in the classrooms and ceramic tile in the bathrooms and something like a, uh, a plank uh, luxury vinyl flooring in the, in the hallway. Those are all waterproof. Um, they have 25, 30 year warranties on them. All a good quality commercial product. As far as the, um, the, the walls and the ceilings, the walls are just going to be a typical gypsum sheetrock painted. Um, we'll do a 24 by 24 suspended ceiling like you have in this building right here. Uh, all the lighting will be LED with all the general lighting and there will be accent lighting. Uh, we do some lighting around the perimeters for, for uh, you know, artwork and just wall wash lighting, just architectural value to it. Um, and then the HVAC return and grills will be in the ceiling as well, just like this. Uh, plumbing fixtures uh, will be typical metal partitions for the bathrooms. We'll do undermount sinks. Um, all the motion sensors for the hand dryers and for the, the faucets and for the, the, the flush, flushometers. Um, everything will be water, water efficient, uh, as much, going as much green as we can with regard to LED lighting, with regard to uh, the, the, the bathroom fixtures being water, water, low, low water usage. Um, as a side note for energy efficiency, we will be having the building solar ready. So all the electrical is designed, so if you ever wanted to add solar to it, you have the availability to connect to it easily. Uh, lighting, again, it's all going to be LED. This is pretty much an overview of what I just mentioned as far as the, uh, the wall washers in the exhibit area and the foyer area, which is for hanging artwork on the walls for uh, good aesthetic value. Um, there will be recessed LED lights. There will be some pendant fixtures. And uh, again, a lot of different lighting options that are available. Uh, it might be, since we're only at around 60 to 70 percent design documents, these are some decisions that we can approach the town with as far as specific locations for lighting, if we wanted to put certain lights in certain areas. And that's it. So it's overall, you know, we're looking to make it energy efficient. Um, it will have adequate landscaping around the perimeter, uh, and other than that, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. You said the roof is solar ready. What's the orientation of the building? Will it be the build? Well, typically you want southeast. It's it looking at the building right now. Uh, you could go back to yeah. You could go back to that plan actually. The first sheet. 
I want to just look at the building, the, the, the roof line. Because we're looking at yeah. west, right? Yeah, you're looking here, and so there's going to be roofs on, on this facing right. uh, uh, south, mm -hmm. which is going to be helpful for So you do have it. something. There will be access on that for it, yes. For future solar panels. Future solar, correct. That's not in this design package. No, but understood. Okay. We're trying to make all of our facilities that we don't necessarily have that capital cost right now to be solar ready. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Um, yeah, not necessarily about the, the structure itself, but as far as this facility, it, we are going to be maintaining it in terms of cleaning it, uh, providing heat, um, cutting the grass, removing the snow. Is that going to be a parks department? Um, CME? That or? still has to be formalized through a licensing okay. agreement with CME, so all of those details haven't been hammered down okay. yet. Okay, right, and that's not part of this presentation. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, speaking of heating and cooling, we'll have a heat pump type system, which is similar to like one of the, the ductless AC units that are in, in that you hang on the wall, but this is the type that the compressor's outside, you have an air handler up top, and there's going to be ducts coming through, so you will be provided with heat and air conditioning from the same unit, which is fed by electric. And they're very energy efficient these days. But there's certainly going to be ongoing maintenance costs in mm -hmm. this building. As much as the building materials are designed to limit maintenance, there's still obviously, you know, somebody's picking up the trash and somebody's mopping the floors and things like that. And, um, whether CME's the tenant or some other group, you know, there, there might be some offsetting of expenses. But uh, I think the town has to understand that when it builds a building like this, you know, we are, we are adding operational cost, you know, but we're also doing something beneficial to the community. So, right. but we should go in understanding that, I think. Okay. Could I just make a request that the toilet facilities be accessible for children? Children, with children mounted yeah. height, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> okay. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many. Uh, good, point. <laughs> good point. Important. Sinks too, everything, right? Yes, absolutely. It's all designed for kids. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to ask that? Um, sure, sure, Vince. you want to come up? Yeah, it'll be quick. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't normally allow public in the work sessions. We'll do it if we can do it quick, Vince. I will be quick. Uh, Vince Taldone uh, from Franco. Two quick questions. One, I'd heard about a ramp access, and with all the universal design possibilities, I'm wondering why there isn't a, you know, a graded to the front door access so that kids who are disabled or ordinary or other kids wouldn't all come through the same door, unless I misunderstood. Is why would we have, usually you put a ramp on a building that you're retrofitting. If you're starting from scratch, it should be universally designed for kids of all abilities. One thought, and I'll give you a set, my other question quickly is, the uh, exhibition spaces will potentially carry much greater loads, not to mention all the people and perhaps an event like a fundraiser, uh, but actual exhibition pieces that are quite heavy. Um, and I wondered if that's being designed into the floor loads. Yes, well, thank you both. Both very good questions, actually. Um, I will confirm with the architectural group that the floor loads, and do we know some weights of some of these items? You know, we have typical designs that we do for gathering spaces as far as loading. So I will look into that, absolutely. And I could give you my card if you want to send me some info for that. So we'll make sure that's addressed. And as far as the heating units, yes, that's, that is definitely... Uh, the yes, ramp. the, the ramps. The ramps. Accessibility. Okay. Um, as far as the accessibility, the, the, there will be all accessible areas. We will have a handicap ramp, a wide handicap accessibility from the parking lot going up to the concrete apron. There's not going to be any specific ramp there. Got it. It's just going to be. It's not a separate entrance. No. It's all the same. Entrance. Entrance. It's all the same. Entrance. It's a big open right, right, front right. of this building. It's okay. 42 feet wide and we'll have a six or eight foot wide ramp that goes up into that right. area. It's all going to be safe and easily accessible. Correct. Yes. And obviously everything inside is ADA. Yeah. Right, yes, room. all eight, absolutely. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are you, are you leaving this?
You can have those, yeah. Okay. Frank, are you going to be available to talk about the charrette the, on the Riverside Trail? Is that something you can update us on? Sure. That happened the other day? Yep. Okay, okay. Frank. All right, so um, that's the last item. Just a couple of brief updates. There is a meeting coming up on Monday the 17th. Um, that will be with consultants for the Hampton Bays Form Base Code. Yeah, that will be at the Hampton Bays Community Center on Ponquag Avenue, 6 p.m. on Monday the 17th. So people are invited to participate. And we did have a charrette recently, and I think, Frank, you were there out in the Riverside community to, on uh, the design of the trail and the, uh, I guess, the opened area at the end of the trail along Correct. the Peconic River. The, the county, the, like, it's probably 14 acres of county-owned property that we have an IMA with them. We hired uh, Ares Designs. They conducted a community charrette Monday evening. Uh, I would guess, uh, and it was a horrible night, a raining and dreary night, but uh, in excess of 50 people wow. showed up. No, and that's I, a good turnout. I have to say that Ares did, a, uh, a, I did, a, did an excellent job. Uh, their materials were very understandable. Their process was very uh, engaging to the community. And I also think that uh, Steve Nerodi, uh, one of the principals of the company, did a, a very good job of helping the community to understand that this is a complex project. You have soils that are foreign to the, uh, the site because they're stretch oils. Uh, certain kinds of indigenous vegetation that we want to plant won't grow in that soil. Uh, the the uh, hydrology is corrupted, by, if you will, by piling dirt willy-nilly all around the property. The shoreline restoration is quite technically and scientifically involved. And I think he demonstrated to the community that these, this firm understands all of those elements and will consider them uh, primarily as they go about a design. What types of things were the community asked to weigh in on at the charrette? Uh, every aspect of it, from, from amenities to plantings to types of activities that they would like to see uh, take place at the site. Uh, the no, Parks Park. Commissioner, Suffolk County Parks Commissioner was there. Oh, it was, okay. And, and spoke a little bit about Because there are the, some limitations, right? There are, and, and that was spoken to. Kyle also did a good job of explaining what those limitations might be. Uh, but I think most of the community understood that. Uh, but it was good to reiterate it. It's primarily a passive park. Uh, that's it's the a, basically it's a, used, yep. a, a trail ADA accessible trail that will lead to the waterfront. Yeah, there are actually two components to the trail. There's the access from uh, Flanders Road to the waterfront, and then this property will be a component of the shoreline trail that eventually will go from Peconic Avenue down to where the CPF site is to uh, the, the project that CPF is working on. So there'd be a uh, if you will, an uh, east-west okay. uh, uh, trail, kind of serpentine in nature, River walk, yeah. and then a north-south trail from the roadway to the waterfront. They talked about um, kayak or canoe launching areas, they talked about fishing stations, they talked about parking facilities, they talked about various kinds of game tables, like a chess table or a marjan table or a, or a uh, 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 bridge tables, concrete structures where people could do gaming of a passive nature, um, and they brought precedent images, uh, and they asked people to select which kinds of activities do you support, and within that activity, what kinds of features would you like? They talked about exercise stations on the walking trail. Uh, uh, Were community members grouped and uh, asked to give input? By yes, they, okay, they gathered in about I would say up to maybe eight or ten uh, groups of four or five residents per That's group. Great, yeah. uh, Aries had five or six of their own staff members to help facilitate and answer questions. Kyle and Janice were, uh, and Dave Wilcox were there to help facilitate, and I just stood around and 
No, are we going? Is, is, uh, <laughs> is Aris Design now coming back here with a potential plan? There is another meeting. I think the date is October 16th, <laughs> where we will be another meeting held in Flanders to give uh, their first version of the uh, uh, plan design. And then there is a second meeting in November, which we will be more final. And that is coordinated in Flanders again at Crohan Center, but that will also be a formal town board work session. Uh, but all of the subsequent meetings are scheduled to take place in Flanders. Now, are larger structures like gazebos allowed, or is that something that's prohibited? Uh, I, I, structures that have like a bathroom facility would be allowed. Open sided structures, which I guess a, a gazebo would be. They are also permitted, okay. uh, but you couldn't create a classroom space, for right. example. But it doesn't mean you could not create an open air, which was one of the options, an open air outdoor gathering area where if uh, um, <laughs> someone from SOFO wanted to come and do a class about local flora and fauna, there isn't a place to sit around and gather right. outdoors. Uh, could be a covered space, but it has to be an open sided structure. Sure. So all of those things were, and it went on uh, almost two hours. Uh, the community was very engaged, uh, and I think it, they'll they'll walk away with some very valuable data to, okay. to come back with some nice design. And now we have budgetary constraints here as well. As do we have we have some money set aside for this? We have some money set aside. Also, for CDBG the design and community downtown grant, and there's a couple uh, different well, sources. Well, this is a uh, environmental justice grant. Okay. And we it was a fifty thousand dollar grant, part and parcel of this design is a community health survey. Uh, about $7,000 of that $50,000 is going to a community health survey. And that health survey is designed to talk about uh, or to investigate what, what outdoor activities could contribute to improving the overall health of the people who reside in that community. We had, I know we had gotten some CDBG money for this, but that's probably going toward ARIS in the, the design. The CDBG money is going to supplement the cost between the 50000 and the, 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 the award of the contract to ARIS. Okay. There's a, there's a discrepancy there. I think the award was, I'm going to guesstimate, but it was closer to 60000 and we had to make up a difference of about $13,000 between the grant award and I do believe that CDGB made up that difference. Okay. Just want to make sure we'll, once we arrive at a plan that we're able to execute the plan. Uh, well, funding for the implementation of the plan has not yet taken place. This is funding for the design uh, and for the health survey. Uh, the design will give us some indications, although the design contract is contractor is not responsible for construction documents, only design documents, but they have agreed to give us uh, figures on approximations so we'd have some idea. Uh, see me, excuse, not see me, excuse me, Franca and the town have submitted consolidated funding application grants for, through the state for subsequent funding for this construction. Okay. Uh, we'll know the results of that late November, early December. Anybody else have questions for Frank regarding this? All right, thank you, Frank. You um, won't answer any questions, but future. Uh, anything else you need to update us on? I think we're okay. okay. Um, and we, of course, are you know keeping an eye on the storm. It's a uh, one hitting North Carolina, South Carolina, Florence. Well, you know, we're not expecting it, it to hit our area, other than you know riptides and you know high surf. Um, so, but uh, certainly our thoughts are with the people in those areas. It, it is a monster of a storm that's kind of parking for a while off of Wilmington. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's, you know, talking about extremely high surf and flooding, um, record you know, Cape Fear. You know that uh, the the river is going to be particularly high. Is that what it's called, Cape? Uh, I think it's called it, right? Cape Hatter. What's the river that goes? It's like Cape Fear, the movie. Cape Fear is the movie. No, what's, what, no, no, it's <laughs> what very I, scary. That's the area. Yeah. Yeah. It's beyond. That's no, I think there. that's the name of a place. It may be. I, I, don't, I, don't, know. I could be no, right. That's I don't the know. setting of the movie. You could be right there. Cape Fear, yeah. The setting is in Cape Fear. I don't watch movies. 
Yeah. The Cape River, is that what it's called? No, Cape Fear. Cape Fear. So, uh, but they're talking about like historic flooding Cape Storm. in the river there. So they have a, a lot of, you know, they have nuclear power plants. There's nuclear power plants they're concerned about. Oh my goodness. Uh, 14 of them. So it's a, uh, you know, and it just, you know, it reminds us too that you know, we're vulnerable as well. So. Yeah. Um, this is a significant event, I guess, uh, the first high tide cycle for the winter storm is tonight, I think around 11 o'clock. Um, any other updates that the board has? I got one quick one. All right, thank you. Um, youth board met last night after our summer hiatus. Um, we are looking for high school students who may be interested in lending their voice in um, helping us plan things for the youth in our community. Um, last year we had a really successful health fair. Um, we're planning on doing another one um, this year. We had the Bake Yourself Happy, which was always great fun. So if you're a high school student within Southampton Town, please reach out to us. We would love to have you on our youth board. Anybody else? Okay, so we do have some executive session items. Uh, confidential legal advice. That's all I'm seeing. Any anything else for exact session? Russell might have some stuff on. Personnel? Yeah. Maybe personnel. So uh, I will make a motion to adjourn our work session and go into executive session for personnel and legal advice. Second. Seconded by Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.